This morning we do come to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 is a rich and powerful passage of scripture where James goes from um, kind of really dealing with some important issues that kind of on the inside to dealing with some issues that are on the outside. And so we come to James chapter 2. I am so grateful for both Ben and Tommy in helping us get ready for James 2 because James 2 is a powerful passage of Scripture that really steps on our toes. I don't think I ever said, if you don't have an outline, lift your hand and the guys uh, that have already passed through the aisle may come back and help you. I'm not sure. Um, But if you don't have an outline, lift your hand. Somebody will get you one. Um, But we come this morning to this. I want us to review for just a moment and notice the title here and we're gonna we're gonna fill it in a little bit more later But this is this is talking about the test of partiality you say well Why the test of partiality? Well, let's look and let's remember where we've been a little bit the review um, right there This is that paragraph at the top and get your pen ready I'm gonna ask you to fill in some things and underline a couple of things even in the first sentence it says this book of the New Testament, we say the 66 books of the Bible, but this book of the New Testament is, underline it, the first known letter. This is the first known letter written to or sent to the early church. It was written by Pastor James. And Pastor James was what? He was a half-brother to Jesus. Jesus' true biological father is the Holy Spirit. He was born of a virgin. But we see that James is one of the half-brothers of the Lord, who at first did not believe, but then came to believe um, later in Jesus' ministry. And he was the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. He was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. Um, Notice the next part there. At this early moment in church history, he is writing, and do you guys remember what goes in here? Do you remember? Don't show it up there yet, Shanna. He's writing to what kind of people? He's writing to very good Jewish Christians. He's writing to Jewish Christians. So these are people who were in Judaism, who had come to faith, and it's not just Jewish Christians, but they were widely scattered, not only throughout the Roman Empire, but even off to the east, um, primarily due to persecution. And so um, he's writing to people who understood Jewish custom. The intention of his letter is to help them evaluate if they have true saving belief in Jesus. You see, he's very concerned that they've made it into the synagogue of of Jewish Christians and yet they still are either remaining in their Judaism or they're remaining in not understanding the gospel the true gospel of Jesus Christ and the true gospel of Jesus Christ is is that this Jesus was the Christ a Christ Christ means anointed one he was Messiah And he was the one that we come and we put our faith in him instead of in anything else. And so James is very concerned that there's people in the church that do not understand this. And in the process, it is his goal also to share wisdom and instruction, fill that in, wisdom and instruction for Christian living. Now in his little letter of five chapters, he gives some tests. And the first one I want you to see here is the test of trials. We looked at that in James chapter um, 1 and verse 2. It starts off with, um, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various what? Trials. Trials. All kinds of trials. And so what he's saying is, is that when you go through trials, it's going to test your faith. It's going to show whether or not you're trusting in God. And so he's concerned about whether or not they have real faith. And he says, one of the ways that you're going to know whether you have real faith is what do you do when a trial comes? He also brings up in chapter 1 the test of temptation. Do you blame God for the sins in your life? Do you blame God for the troubles in your life? Or do you recognize your fallen flesh? Do you recognize your fallenness? And so it's this issue of, of God's not the problem. And then there we see there is the test of the response to God's word. 
Do you receive the word of God? How do you respond to the word of God? Do you reject the word of God or do you accept the word of God? You see, that's a, that's a big question. True Christians, what, what James is saying is, is that two, true Christians receive the word of God. They say, well, if he said it, then I'm going to respond to him in acceptance of what he said. He is the authority and I am not. And so he's, he's challenging them. How do you deal with trials? How do you deal with temptation? How do you deal with the word of God in your heart? And now we come to James chapter 2 where we see the test of partiality. The test of partiality. Now, I want you to notice something. You kind of just notice this on the screen as we click through this. Is it a sin to go through a trial? No. no. The first one is not a sin. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. How you deal with the temptation and how your general response to, is all of this God's problem or is this my problem, which is part of what James is dealing with, that's not a sin to have that question. How about this, the, the next one? The test of response to God's word, is that a sin? Well, no, it's, it's not a sin. Ho hopefully you're responding. These, these do not necessarily mean a sin. But we come to this fourth test when we come to James chapter 2 and we see, okay, the test of partiality, is this a sin? Yes. This is a sin. So James is, James is now shifting the focus from, okay, how do you respond to these other things? And now he's saying, church, individuals who claim Christ, are you partial? Do you judge people on the outside? Do you, do you look at them as man looks at them? You see, now James goes to, in the South we have this phrase, he goes to meddling. Have you ever heard that before? He's, he's down to meddling. Now he's going to mess with you a little bit. Now he's going to mess with you about not just what's going on internally with you, but, and we even see this at the end of James chapter 1, if you look there, he's, he's starting to talk about faith on the outside in, at the end of James chapter 1, but now he comes to this issue of partiality, and he, he goes, this is true, and at the end of James 1, he says, this is true and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father to keep one's, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Well, that's, that's more outward. And now we came to come to James chapter 2 where he's dealing with partiality and it's very much an outward issue. And so I, I just want you to see that, that the sermon title is not just about the test of partiality, but it's now about the what? The sin of partiality. So, yeah, help me out, fill in your title of your message, even has a blank in it. That guy will put blanks in anything, a title. And where, where are we going with all of this? Notice the next one there. The tests move from inward to outward in James's work, in his letter, in his concern. The inward of how are you dealing with the trials in life to, you know, do you really understand that, that God is not the one to blame? Do you, you know, have you received the word implanted and now is it really playing out in your life and how you deal, listen to this, with the people around you? And so I do, because our church is so intent on really learning God's word, you know, if you come and you dive in and you're here week after week after week, I, I, I just want to share with you that we are seeking to get all we can out of God's Word and not just hear a nice sermon with three points and a poem and a little bit of a, little bit of a doctrine here and there and, and kind of go away feeling better about ourselves. That's not the goal at all. The goal is that we would allow God to transform us, renew our minds, and transform our lives. And that's why we study His Word. And that's why you can go home and you can read this. That's why you have notes. So you can go back home and you can look over this and you can pray over this and you can reread these passages and reread these points and look at James's message. And when we finish a book of the Bible, if you stay with us, you have a pretty good understanding of what that book is pretty much all about. 
So I just want to encourage you that, that we want to be centered on the eternal truths of God's word as we look at this. Look at James chapter 2, and I do want to read it again. I'm so grateful for Tommy reading that so well, but look with me, and let's let this flow over us again and see this test, this sin of partiality that we're going to deal with over the next few weeks. Look at James chapter 2 and verse 1. My brothers, and, and here's the, I've bolded the top line because this is the theme of the, the rest of it. This is, you, get, you get verse 1, you're getting the picture of the whole thing. But he says it starts in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And that is very important that he brings up he, this is Christ, the Lord of glory, and we're going to see here, he is the Lord of glory that does not have partiality, no looking at the outside. This is part of his glory. This is part of his glory, and he's called us to follow in his glory. He's called us to honor his glory. And so he says, show no partiality as you hold faith in Christ Jesus, hold the faith, in Christ Jesus, um, the Lord of glory. Look at verse 2. If a man wearing a... He bring, makes an illustration right away. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, verse 3, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there and sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with... What does it say there? evil thoughts. Can you underline that? You see, this is evil. This is sin. He is showing us it's not a little sin, it's a big sin. In fact, he's devoting, the, the, the book of James is pretty short, and it's getting 13 verses right here. This is a big deal to God. Verse 5, listen, my beloved brothers, so he's calling them, he, he, he's calling, and I'm hoping you're my beloved brothers, maybe in Judaism, hopefully in Christ as well. In verse 5 he says, listen my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in, fam rich in faith and uh, heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him, to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man and are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court. We're going to see what that means uh, in an, about a week, maybe two weeks. Verse 7, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? We're going to see what those two verses mean. Look at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, underline that, royal law according to the scripture. Because that's the baseline. That is the basis for which we're going to get all of this. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, underline it, you are committing sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you, commit if you do not commit adultery and do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to, his, to him who has shown no mercy, to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's get our bases for this and go ahead and flip your page and let's recognize the reality of God's impartiality. We need to recognize that this is a very important issue to God. It is part of his character. It's part of who he is. And we are called to be like him. You see, Christians, the word Christian means little Christ. It used to be a derogatory term in the Roman Empire. Oh, he's a Christian. He's a little Christ. He's one of those weird guys. 
He's one of those guys that's, you know, for all intents and purposes for them, they were considered atheists because they didn't believe in all the Roman gods, Greek gods. They, they were considered incestuous because they loved their brothers and their sisters. They were considered cannibals because they ate the body and the blood of Christ, ate the body and drank the blood of Christ. I mean, you see all of this misunderstanding of the world around us, of the true message of Christ, and it was mocked. And so here we are called to be like Christ. Well, we need to understand that when he is talking about partiality and when James brings up the issue of partiality, our world, listen, our world is filled with partiality. But God, in his essence, he has no part of partiality. And over the next few weeks, I, I believe that we're going to see this, but right now, I really want you to see how much God is impartial and how much this is an important point to him. Fill in uh, just three thoughts here to, to help you understand where we're going. Pastor James shines light on a massively important attribute of God. This is an attribute of God that's very important, and it's a wickedly sinful tendency of man. So when we talk about the holiness of God, we're talking about several different attributes that are involved with that, and one of those that we often overlook is impartiality. Notice here with me, the impartiality of God, this is the second part here, the impartiality of God, or the impartial nature of God, is often overlooked. What are the big ones that we talk about? Just kind of notice the screen with me for a moment. We talk about his omnipotence, God's omnipotence. And what does that mean? All powerful. We talk about God's omnipresence. What does that mean? He's present everywhere. We talk about God's omniscience. And what does that mean? His all knowingness. We talk his, about his omnibenevolence. And that means that he is all good. He is all loving. We talk about the aseity of Christ. The aseity of Christ. This means he is self-existent. He, he, he doesn't come from anything beyond himself. He, he didn't come from anyone or anything else. And, and we often talk about his sovereignty. If we really understand his authority over the universe is his authority over man. We come to recognize that he is the supreme authority in all things. But we, uh, we know those, we, we embrace those, we accept those, but we have often overlooked the impartiality of God. I mean, there's many others that we could mention. We could mention the immutability of God, the fact that he doesn't mutate, he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we, we, you could say, well, pastor, did we leave out holiness? Well, here's, the, here's the idea. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. It means different than the rest. Well, if you look at that list, is there anyone that is like those? There's none that is none. There is no God like this God. In fact, there is no other God. There is no other one that's all-powerful, all-knowing, all, all, everywhere, all the time. I mean, he is it. He is self-existent. He is the Holy One that is set apart from his universe in the fact that he is like no other. And his impartiality is critically important. And I want you to see this in the third statement there. This, critically, this, this impartiality of God is critically important for us to realize because of its implications concerning our salvation, concerning our worship, and concerning our behavior as Christ followers. It doesn't, it, it, it's not acceptable for us to just recognize God is impartial and then go on about our lives. It's important that we too, if we're going to be Christ followers, take on his impartiality. And it's a big enough deal that James deals with it head on, full bore. And he's saying to the church, if you're a true church, 
if you're a true Christian in the church, then you need to deal with this issue that is so prevalent in the world around you and so prevalent in your own flesh and in your own fallenness to recognize that if you've come to Christ and he has redeemed you and saved you and forgiven you and is giving you a new nature and a new set of priorities, impartiality is part of the package. That's part of the picture that is here. Now, I, I just, the reason you have a three-pager this morning is not because the sermon's going to be three times longer or anything like that. It really is only so that you can really read the passages. I, I was texting with Ben and, and Edward last night, and I, I just, I was so excited for you to be able to read these passages. As I was reviewing my notes last night before I went to bed, and I just said, Lord, would you use these passages written on these pages and every eye reading these words to say, wow, this is what God says. This is what God, you know, very often we hear a point out of the scripture. We hear some principle out of the scripture where we go, oh, I guess that's right, you know, whatever. But have we really meditated? Have we seen it with our own two eyes? This morning, I want you to see it with your own two eyes. From Second Chronicles, Old Testament, Second Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 7. And notice here with me in verse 7. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, circle it, or partiality, or taking bribes. He's saying, be careful about what you do. This holy God he has no partiality. We're going to see that. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who is not partial, underline that, and takes no bribe. I mean, you, you see the importance of of Deuteronomy 10, 17, I mean, you see the descriptors there at the beginning of verse 17? Look what it says. For the Lord your God is God of gods. And He's Lord of lords. The great, the mighty. And then He goes on, the awesome God. And then what comes right after this grand picture of who God is? He's impartial. Have we not overlooked that sometimes? Notice the next part. Malachi 2, verse 9. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people insomuch as you do not keep my ways. Underline my ways. And what are his ways? Impartiality. He says, you do not keep my ways, but you show partiality in your instruction. These are serious, serious Warnings, these are serious accusations from God's word to our hearts. I love, in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 9, and if you would, just circle that whole little section that's right there. This has, I remember the first time I started to see this issue was back in high school, and it was here at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church that someone was teaching a lesson, and I remember somehow this this verse got into my mind and my heart, and I can kind of trace back um, the basis of this starting to be laid in my life when I noticed this story. Do you remember the story with me? Saul was a wicked king. It was time for God to replace Saul, and so he was looking for a new king. And what does he do? But he comes, and he says, to Samuel, his prophet, and he goes to Jesse's sons, and he says, Samuel, go down to Bethlehem, and I have a king for you to anoint. And so Samuel, being the prophet of the Lord, goes down to Bethlehem. And there he goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse has many sons, and they start parading the sons before Jesse, right? I mean, before Samuel. And then here we come. Notice this, Samuel goes to Bethlehem to anoint a new king, Jesse's son Eliab is brought before him, and he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He's, Samuel's just going, man, this guy is awesome. He's big. He's strong. Listen to his voice. He's the, perhaps the eldest son of Je This guy, Eliab, has got to be it. Look at verse 7. 
But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for he looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? At the heart. Make a note out there to the side. External versus internal. I want you to see that 1 Samuel catches it for us. And, and notice this, that it's not just an instruction of the Lord just saying this uh, in general, in theoretical terms. This is a very practical application that affected the nation of Israel and that would affect the lineage of Jesus' own line, the Messiah. That there in Bethlehem, son of Jesse, we see this principle played out that God looks on the inside whereas man looks on the outside. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, and just right out there to the side, verse 17, I left that off, but in Deuteronomy 1, 17, Moses tells the people to judge justly. He's saying, okay, everybody, everybody, we, we need to judge justly as we move forward without partiality, he's saying this. He's not going to judge it. He's saying way down in the tribes, way down in the whole nation um, of the Hebrews that are there in the desert, and, and Moses can't judge every dispute that's in the camp. He can't judge every group. So he's instructing to the other leaders within the tribes as they're there. And he's saying, you judge without partiality. Look what it says in verse 17, Deuteronomy 1, 17. You shall not respect persons in judgment, but you shall hear, circle it, the small as well as what? the great. You shall not be afraid of the faith of man, for the judgment is God, and the cause that is too hard for you, excuse me, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it to me and I will hear it. So he's saying, that, okay, if it gets too complicated for you, if it's really too difficult, then let it move up through the ranks and eventually I, I will help you with the judgments concerning the disputes between men and women. And so we see this, that you shall not respect persons. We're going to look at that. What does that mean a little bit more? Look at Leviticus 19, verse 15. You shall do no injustice in judgment. So no injustice in judgment. And I've underlined it. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But you are to judge your neighbor fairly. It's in Leviticus. Back in Deuteronomy 15. We see this, and this, is, this is an important part that we see here. Um, if the poor comes in need for help, lend to him even in the sixth year. Now, I want you to notice this on the screen in front of you. In the nation of Israel, in the nation among the Hebrews under the law, you, would, you could borrow if you had need from a neighbor or from a friend or someone in your town. You, you could borrow, but on the sabbatic year, on the seventh year, what would happen to all those debts? They were released. You say, where did that plan ever go away? Why, why don't we have that back? I'd kind of like that. <laughs> How many of you would vote for that? You, you would like that? Okay. Doesn't work that way. Now, there's some people alive today who think, oh, the debt will just go away. That's, uh, that doesn't work either um, in this day and time. But, but here, and if you read, if you go back and read Deuteronomy 15, like I did this week, it's beautiful. God said, hey, let me be your God. I'm going to be your king, and I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of, and I'm going to make sure that you prosper. And what I want you to do is, as you guys are all getting along together, help one another, sacrifice for one another, lend to one another. And every seven years, if anyone has debt, let that debt be released. Don't get nervous about it. I'm God. I will make sure everything is okay. Okay. It, you see, it was a lesson of faith and obedience. And he kept going back to that issue of obedience. He said in Deuteronomy 15, he says, obey me in this, obey me in this, trust me in this. You know, there's so much of the Christian life where the Lord gives us an instruction and we're sitting there kind of grappling, do I really want to do that? But that would be hard. It may not turn out the way I want it to turn out. But, but God says for me to do this. 
the Holy Spirit is laying this on my heart. Will I obey? Will I trust God with this? Deuteronomy 15, that is exactly the picture for the nation of Israel and for the, for the believers in Israel. And it's the same thing for you and for me. That God is saying, trust me in this, obey me even when you're nervous about how it's going to turn out. And listen to this, he says in, in Deuteronomy 15, even if a guy comes to you at the sixth year and says, I really need help, can, can I borrow? He says, don't hold back from that brother, thinking that he's just doing this to get, take advantage of the sabbatic year coming up. God is saying, I'm God, I'm big enough to take care of him, and I'm big enough to take care of you. You just obey. Don't hold it against the poor man. Don't think, he's poor, he's not going to be able to pay me back by January 1st, 7th year. I'm not going to loan to him. God specifically says, don't do that. So this is, this is being played. I don't know how Raphael feels about this, our banker and some of our other bankers here. He's probably going, uh, Pastor, I'm sorry to tell you, but that'll never work. I, I understand, but this isn't the nation of Israel as well. But we see how God was bringing his people along through the Old Testament, and God was showing them who he was. And they were a people that God had chosen to move through, and we're going to see that as we study this issue of partiality and how God does that but we see that he means it. In Proverbs 24, in verse 23, let's read verse 23 out loud together. Would you please read this with me? Verse 23 says, These also are sayings of the wise to show partiality in judgment is not good. Underline that. To show partiality in judgment is not good good. Would you read with me the next verse, Proverbs 28 and verse 21. Look what it says in verse 21, everybody. To show partiality is not good, but for a piece of bread a man will do wrong. Underline that first part. To show partiality is not good. God is good. He is good all the time. He is always good, and he is not impartial and he calls us to see what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. And he's saying that impartiality is good, partiality is wrong. Now there's four statements on the last page, and I want you to see these very quickly. One, two, three, four, they're underlined all the way through. You can put a little, I didn't put numbers on them, that's fine. But I just want you to get these concepts as we launch into James 2. The first one is this, God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. Now, just so you understand, this is not a bad thing, this is a good thing. Some of you would say, well, wait a minute, he doesn't have respect for people? I thought we're supposed to have respect for people. And I, I, I want you to understand, there's two, there's two different thoughts concerning this, there's two different ways, perspectives in understanding this. The, the one thought that this passage is talking about is, is that you don't want God to be a respecter of persons. And we're going to see that in this study. If God is a respecter of persons, then we're in trouble. It affects your salvation. It affects your daily life. And if you are a respecter of persons, going against what God has said and how he is, it's going to affect your life. It's not about respect versus disrespect. This isn't on your outline. I just want you to see this. It's not about respect versus disrespect. Rather, think of it like this. There's respect, there's the middle of no respect, and then there's disrespect. And, and there's, there's different issues that are involved with this. The real picture is that it has to do with the external versus the internals. We see the externals of man and are tempted to judge based upon those, but we're not God. God knows what he's doing in the heart of each individual, and you don't know what he's doing in the heart of each individual. And so we come, we are instructed to come, 
seeing what God is doing in his word and in his truth about the values of what we're to be. We're going to unpack that a little bit more as we go on in the study. But the big issue is the external versus the internals. Look with me as it says in Romans chapter 2. Paul says, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil. Of the Jew first? Wow. So this is tribulation and, anger, and anguish for those who do evil. Of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to every man who works good. To the Jew first and to the Greek. For there is no respect of persons with God. You say, well now wait a minute. Isn't this a contradiction? The Jew for, I mean, it sounds like God is being partial toward the Jews. Don't miss Wednesday nights. You will miss the answer to that question. How, how can God deal, how can God play favorites with the Jews, with the Hebrews? How, and yet he's calling us not to be, Esau I love, Jacob I love, Esau I hated. What, what does that mean? How does this work? Come and study with us over these next few weeks as we look at what God is doing and what he says. But understand that line that has been underlined there, for there is no respect of persons with God. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. And this is just a, a, a bit of commentary here. Paul writes to slaves, to employees and masters. Go read Ephesians 6. I read it last week on vacation. I read, Marcy and I read the whole book of Ephesians out loud one morning. You know what we did? We, we went and we sat at a friend's house and we, we slept and we ate and we read and we slept and we ate and we read and then we read and we read and we slept and we ate and then we ate and we ate and we ate and we slept and we read. We, we, we did about those three things for uh, a few days. We, we just enjoyed catching up on our reading, the books that we wanted to read and being in the Word. We, we just sat one morning and um, we just read carefully through the book of Ephesians. Just, just took it all in at once out loud together. And I, I just want to encourage you to let God's Word just wash over you and here in Ephesians 6, notice Paul writes, he's writing to slaves, to employees, and masters, employers, and he says, your master is also in heaven, and neither is there respect of persons with him. That's a direct quote, underline that part. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Now notice what, how this plays out. He doesn't have greater affection for, or love for, blessing for a manager, a president, a vice president, an executive, a boss that he does not have for the humblest of all slaves. And this very concept is repeated in Colossians 3 and it's repeated in Colossians 4. God is not a respecter of persons. And this is massively important and we can be very glad for it because the, the kind of part of the overview on this is that, is that there's always someone better, there's always someone brighter, there's always someone bigger, there's always someone faster, there's always someone prettier. Um, I remember when God began to use that in my heart a little bit, um, I... I went off to Florida State, and I was at Florida State, and I met a guy named Pete Charpentier, who today remains one of my closest friends. He lives in Atlanta. He's an executive for NCR. And, um, and we, were, we were talking, and we were visiting a lot, and he said, yeah, it's kind of interesting when you get up here in a different environment from home. He said, at home, you know, you're kind of, everybody thinks you're great, and everybody loves you, and everybody's, everybody's kind of all, you know, they're excited about your life, maybe excited that you're going off to school, and you've, you've kind of been something, and then you get up here amidst this crowd, and you realize you ain't nothing compared to everybody else. You start to realize, well, there's some people that are pretty sharp up here. There's people that are pretty cool up here. There's people that are better looking than you. There's people that are better this, better than that, and everything else. And you start to realize that you're a little fish in a big pond. And you see, if that was not the case that God is impartial, then we would be looking at all of these comparisons of ourselves and of others to the others around them, to the world standards, and we would be in big trouble. But our God is not like that. Look at 
the second one here that is underlined. God is not partial when disciplining sin. He is not partial when he's disciplining sin. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. And this is Peter in the New Testament referencing to the Old Testament. And he says in verse 16, Since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. Underline that because I want you to recognize you shall be holy as I am holy. God calls us to be like him. And he is holy. He is not like the things of the world. And so we are called to not be like the world. That's why the C.J. Mahaney book, the, the book on worldliness, is such a great little book. That's good, Edward. Thank you. This, this is a, a great book by, by a, a pastor from Maryland, C.J. Mahaney. He's part of the, the Gospel Coalition and certainly part of Together for the Gospel Group. Um, and he writes, I love him because he writes little books. Do you see how thin that book is? Even I can read that one. Um, but I, I just want to encourage you that he, he's exploding the holiness of God in our lives and the fact that we really can honor the Lord. We really can follow after the way of God. And God calls this right here. He says, you shall be holy for I am holy. You see, he's going to come clean our heart and our mind. And then it, it is our job to respond to him in faith, in belief, and listen, Jesus said, in obedience. And so in verse 16 we see it says, it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. Verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially, you see our God judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. You see, we're, we're, not, we're, we're in exile right now. We're not in heaven yet. We're going to get to heaven. We still live in a fallen world. This world is not our home. We are going to a, a promised possession, a promised land that is glorious. Read the book of Revelation and see the description of where we are going in Christ. And so in this exile, as we live, look at what verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the, what does it say? The futile, the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, you could write out there to the side, partiality as one of them, not with perish you were ransomed, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with what? But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Now, I want you to see this, that he's saying, you have been ransomed with the perfectness of God, and he's called you to live like him. He's called you to truly be a Christian in South Florida in 2016. He's called you to be a Christian at work. He's called you to be a Christian at home. He's called you to be a Christian in your emails, in your texts, in your Facebook, in your Instagram, in your Snapchat. He's called you to be a Christian in your music. He's called you to be a Christian in the way that you dress, in the way that you, with your bank account, with, with the boardroom, or with the, the stock room, or whatever it is in your job, he's called you to be a Christian. And so... He says, because you weren't ransomed with something that was cheap, you were ransomed with the blood of the Creator. And if He humbled Himself to come save you, why can't you live for Him? We are called to live for Him. You say, that seems so impossible. That seems, I just, I just can't do that. Listen, no. You, you see, the thing that makes it possible is not only the forgiveness and the washing clean by the blood of Christ, but listen to this. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God that comes to live within you gives you the power to be holy as He is holy. Amen. This is the Christian life. This is the, this is the walk of sanctification. This is the walk of, of these next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, how much ever longer you have on this earth, that you are getting ready for heaven. And you are walking in the privilege of walking under the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ, getting ready to be with God. That is the picture. So he's saying the way you walk and the way you live and the way you judge is important, not with externals, but with internals. Remember with me the letter of Jude 
and I won't re-preach the 25 verses of Jude, but you remember with me this, that the, the judgment on very religious Christian preachers who go apostate, you remember that? It was all about preachers who go apostate. It was all about preachers who, who leave the gospel. And they preach the gospel for their own gain. They preach the gospel for their own fame. They preach the gospel for their own sexuality. And all of this foolishness that we see not only in 2016 in the world, but we, we've seen it for the last two millennia. In fact, Jude said, hey, these guys aren't coming. These guys are here. And they're preaching the gospel for their own gain. And now, what we remember in this is God does not show partiality about this. In fact, those guys, their judgment, notice what the screen says, their judgment is for the utter darkness. It's for the darkest of the darkness. The judgment that they are going to get is, is severe. It's the most severe. And so we see that there's this beauty of the impartiality of God in dealing with your sin and dealing with my sin. Notice the third one that is here. Even Christ's enemies proclaimed his impartiality. Even Christ's enemies proclaimed his impartiality. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 22. In verse 15, it says, The Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. Verse 16. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. Wow. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by what? Appearances. Appearances. You see, even they knew that Jesus was right on in being impartial. They could see it. They had listened to him enough. And as they were listening to him, they, they, now here they come with flattery, and they're going to try to trap him. And then, of course, they come along and they say, verse 17, Tell us then what, do you, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They're seeking to turn the crowd against him. But in their, in their entrapment, they flatter with something that they believe to be true, I, I think. But yet they could not see the impact of that. The fact that he was... The teach, he taught the way of God faithfully. He did not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by, and that's the whole picture, you're not swayed by appearances. And it's almost as if they could say, you're not swayed by appearances as we are. Because they were obsessed with appearances. Number four as we wrap up. God is not partial in the salvation of people. God is not partial in the salvation of people. You see, Acts 10.35 is this beautiful chapter where we see it's not just the Jews who are being saved, but who else is being saved now? The Gentiles. What does Gentile mean? It just right above there, non-Jew. That's, that's what it means. The non-Jews. Now, the gospel is for them too. Look with me in verse 35, in Acts 10, verse 35. But in every nation... Anyone who fears him and does what is right is, is acceptable to him. Underline that, every nation. Every nation. That, now, it doesn't mean every geopolitical border like Romania and Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia or Czech, Slovak. Or whatever. It's not talking about the United States versus us. It's talking about the, the ethnos of the world, all of the different people groups. God is not a respecter of the differences in all these, but every nation, every people group, anyone who fears him, who fears him and does what is right and is acceptable to him. And then we come to this beautiful portion at the end of the Bible in Revelation, John's Revelation. He sees the scene in heaven. In Revelation chapter 5, and it's also seen, very similar words, in Revelation 7, John's vision of the scene in heaven. Look at verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. And by your what? By your blood. That means by your death. 
you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now that word from is important. Circle the word from. Because it's not that he ransoms everybody who's ever existed. It, here's the picture. He's making his point that as the world is different, so my grace can go to different nests. I'm going to, I'm going to come and rescue people out of, out of every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. Verse 10, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Now, back up there at the top by Acts chapter 10, verse 20, uh, 35, I want you to notice this. It's Gentiles are being saved too. It is God's grace to every race. It's God's grace to every race. God, God is no respecter of persons. He, he comes and he redeems. He comes and he works. He comes and he's no, he doesn't look at the outside as man looks at the outside. The externals are not important to him. And there's a lot of different externals. There's a lot of different ways that we can look at the externals. And I, I've just listed a few of them here at the bottom of the sheet. There's the rich versus the poor. There's the sick versus the healthy. There's the high versus the low. The high what? Well, the high in status. Maybe the high in intelligence. Maybe the high in education versus the low. No, no that doesn't matter to God. Male and female. Every race, every nation, every, underline it, background. And that's important because some come from a background of, of really clean nearness to God. There are some who were raised in Christian homes. There are some who were raised in, back in the day in faithful Jewish homes. And then there were, there were pagans banging at the door of Israel. And we see even in the Old Testament that there were, there were pagan nations that God went out after. He sent Jonah out after a pagan, wicked people. And Jonah didn't want to go. In fact, God's man, Jonah, would rather them go to hell. He said, I don't want to go. If I go and preach to them the righteousness of God and repentance toward God, you're likely to save them. That was how hard Jonah's heart was. You see, God works and he moves amidst every background. And he says to sinners, come one, come all. And come one, come all to what? The precious blood of Christ. Now before you pack up, just think of this. What do we do with these two things? Wait just a minute, wait just a minute. There's two things we can do. This is not on the outline. We can see God's impartiality and repent of our partiality. And we can see God's impartiality and rejoice in His salvation rejoice in the fact that you see if he was partial there'd be no hope for me I don't know about you maybe maybe you know you're perfect and ready for it no you're not we we can repent of our partiality and we can rejoice in his salvation and let me tell you that maybe you've come to us this morning and you have never seen that God loves you so much that he gave his own blood for you what he calls you to do is to believe in him. He calls you to turn to him, to turn away from your sin and to trust in him and not yourself. And listen, for Christians, for Christians in this room, he calls you to see his holiness anew and afresh and to see his holiness involves his impartiality and that we need to let him come and do surgery on our hearts that we would truly think like he thinks and love like he loves and respond as he responds. Would you pray with me?